Welcome to Africa LSB podcast, your monthly podcast for language services in Africa, where we give trends, translation, interpretation, localization, and language industry in general. This podcast is presented by Bolingo Communications and Media Council and hosted by the wonderful Adina Maran Kulibali. If you want to give your feedback, or featured on the podcast, just send us an email at the address info at bilingualconsult.com. This podcast is supported by Multilingual, your go-to source for language industry news since 1987. Hello and welcome to another episode of Africa's LSP podcast. In this episode, we're discussing game localization and the rise of Arabic in the gaming industry. My guest is Eman Abdul. She is an English Arabic translator and specializes in game localization and transcreation. Eman, you're welcome to the podcast. Hi, Adi. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very glad to be with you today. And I hope our audience enjoy our talk today about game localization. Most definitely, Emma, and I believe that our listeners are going to enjoy this podcast and that we're going to have a great time. As you introduce yourself to our listeners, Emma, I'm curious to know how your journey into game localization began. Is it something that you've always yearned for or are there specific events in your life that led you on this path? Yeah, sure. Um, this is Iman Abdul. I'm an English Arabic translator and specialize in localization and transcreation. I translate marketing text, e-commerce projects, and video games. Um, I started in game localization when I was starting out as a translator, and I worked on um, the translation of a very popular game. And I found the idea of working as a video game uh, translator very interesting. Um, yeah, so my hobbies are basically reading, uh, playing games, um, listening to a useful podcasts, and of course, definitely music. But I love useful podcasts like yours so much. Um, yeah, that's all about me. Can you tell us about how it all started? How did you, uh, you know, start loving this industry and get into it that much? Yeah, since since I was a kid, I loved playing um, online games. Uh, you know, like the the PC games at the at that time when I was you know um, a little younger uh, was very popular. And you know, I'm into adventure and open world games. So I used to play these games and I enjoy my my time and enjoy myself after studying and reading and you know all the duties you have as a little kid. Uh, then the more I I delve into um, you know the translation and I find many specializations including video games. Uh, I find it very interesting. Although I um, I wasn't that kind of people who appreciate <laughs> video game uh, translators because when I was playing, I I used to play uh, using the English language. And um, because every time I change the language in Arabic, I find it very difficult. Um, it's not because I don't understand Arabic. It's it's my <laughs> it's my native. Uh, but the the language used in the translation is, you know, like people or translators. Uh, I thought they should have done a better job um, when it comes to translating video games. And um, Sometimes I look at the sentence and I know, you know, like I know the source uh, text of this sentence because I played the game in English. And when I see the translation, I, I say to myself, use a, a good style, use a, a fancier word, use a good language or a better language. So I was like a little bit annoyed with the language used or the style translators used. Um, but when I <laughs> became myself a, <clears throat> a video games uh, translator, I found it's totally um, different because there are so many restrictions there over uh, translation and you have style guides, you have many instructions from the client, you have, you know, character limits, you have like 
so many things that you are, should abide by and these so many things affect the translation and impact the way you see the translation from the gamer perspective. But if you were, you know, if you tried to delve in the industry and became yourself a video game translator, you find it very difficult and very challenging. So based on that experience, like when you are now playing a video game, how do you appreciate the, the translations or the no. localization? <laughs> Absolutely not. I respect everyone who working <laughs> in this industry because I know the challenges myself and I, you know, every project has its own challenges and has its own instructions and style guides and, you know, a set of things that you should follow and, you know, the, the client's instructions that, you know, it's changed uh, over time and the more you delve into the project the more you have like um, things you should ask the client about so I respect so much everyone who translates video games because it's not easy at all because it's not like you're translating uh, a legal text I know legal text is, is difficult definitely but it's like you're not changing the cultural elements you're not changing uh the names you're not considering if this language is a gender language you don't have this character limits uh, of anything so you're free to use you know some things uh, or some um uh, some forbidden stuff here in video games so Eman, this is the first time that we're discussing localization on the podcast. So it'd be great if you can give us some background information on what localization is all about so that our listeners can be on the same page with us. Yeah, sure. Um, localization is the adaption of a product or a service to meet the needs of a particular audience and a particular language or culture, and even sometimes dialect. So you're changing uh, all the cultural elements. Uh, including measurements, uh, time zones, uh, the idiomatic expression, the currencies, uh, national holidays, uh, local color sensitivities and religious sensitivities, and even emojis. Um, so a little mistake can make a huge impact on the translation. And we all know that when the translation is good, nobody talks about it. But when it's bad, you know, you're done as a translator and as a, as a business. Um, so, for example, the, the, the colors and the, the sensitivities of colors of every culture, uh, it, it varies from one country or from one culture to another. For example, if I'm translating a text from um, English into like to a Latin American audience, for example, I would say that feel the happiness with this yellow dress. This is not a good thing to translate for Latin American. Why? Because yellow has a negative connotation and it's linked to this and mourning in Latin America. But it's, it's, it's associated with success and high standard of living in some African countries. Germany, on the other hand, links a yellow with envy and jealousy. So, you know, like every country or every region has, you know, some connotations with even colors. Um, you know, emojis too are different. You know, like sometimes you deal with a person or you're chatting with your fr international friends and you send um, a thumb up or, or an emoji saying yeah to someone and you feel that's okay and they find that it's offensive. So a very, um, every little uh, thing that you should be careful uh, when you're localizing the text. And this makes the, the, the whole idea is like you're adapting everything, you're changing any cultural element. Otherwise, your product is done if you don't consider this. And in the video games, there are so many countries that ban certain, uh, certain things. Uh, for example, Germany and Brazil, um, you know, banning so many of the video games related to violence, like shooting games, and when this game is banned in this and in, in one country, the sales uh, decreases, and you, you you need to like um, release a new version of this game censored. Like for example, uh, Call of Duty Black Ops in in Germany. 
Um, it's banned because of high impact gory uh, violence. And the, the solution was releasing a censored version. And why not? You can play the game after making it censored. So considering everything is key in localization. Thank you so much, Eman, for the examples that you gave. Now, I am just wondering, can that have an impact on the choice of professionals who work on a particular project? For instance, as an English, Arabic translator and localization specialist, are you able to work on localization games that are meant for other countries aside Egypt? Um, you know, in Arabic, the situation is like uh, different a little bit because we have over 20 uh, countries that speak Arabic. So choosing one language for 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 every country is not that easy, and it's not will um, will make profits for the the business or the company. Here in Arabic, we use the modern standard uh, Arabic and like the official newspapers and you know uh, web content um, if it's official regarding um, you know like a government. Every country has its own dialect, and this make the, the whole thing uh, a bit difficult to make it in one dialect. In the past, this was the norm that because uh, Egyptian Arabic is the lingua franca, uh, because most of the Arabs, like all of them, understand Arabic because it's the popular language they use to watch movies, uh, sitcoms, um, plays in, in Egyptian Arabic. So they understand the our dialect very well. So uh, in the past, the, the norm was to translate the game into Egyptian Arabic and everybody will understand. But this time is, is different. Uh, you have to use modern standard Arabic, but when it comes to like using a creative or um, in-game dialogues or something like this, you you can use the dialect of the character or of the people and in, including included in the in this part of the game. So you have given us a definition of localization and also provided some examples of what happens when localization is not properly done. Can we go on to look at the processes that are involved when it comes to localization? Let's say, for instance, a client reaches out to you and wants you to localize a game or a software. What are the various steps that you're going to follow in order to carry out such a project? Yeah, let's start a little by defining game localization, just to know the, the, the main goal of game localization. Uh, look, uh, game localization is the process of translating a video game for a foreign market. So the main focus here is to entertain the users who are the players in this case. So it's user oriented, but it's not only translating texts. You're translating um, videos, images, sounds, songs, animations, because you know you're playing and you're watching something, and the content cannot be disassociated with the audiovisual uh, content you're you're receiving or you're you're watching. So you should consider all the cultural um, elements in the game, like numbers, hyperlinks, um, colors, even the covers of the video games, uh, measurements, the legislations that are used in in different con that are varied in uh, in countries and the names of the game and, and the characters inside the game. We have five steps to get a game localized. Uh, starting step number one with globalization in which we are studying the market in general, the company or the, the games uh, company st study the market in general. Step number two is internationalization in which we, the company, analyze the game to know how it will be localized into different languages and discover the possible issues regarding target languages uh, like character limits, unsupported fonts, special characters, uh, just to make sure that the localization process will go smoothly. Um, step number three is the localization and it's the translation of the game and the content of this game. Uh, after the localization, we have step number four, 
linguistic quality assurance or linguistic quality assessment that is done by companies or people to make sure that all the linguistic elements in the game are um, are followed correctly and there's no issues regarding any linguistic element in the game. The final step is uh, testing. You test the game, uh, you hire a company or people just to test the game uh, by playing it to spot the bugs and possible errors in the game. And after that, voila, your game is localized and ready to be served for the target language or the target audience. Uh, but um, not all the clients choose to go through all these. Um, yeah, these these steps are like for everyone. But the process of localization itself is not like the same um, in every situation, because we have uh, like three types of localization in video games. Uh, sometimes the client asks for basic localization. In basic localization, we translate the information about the game in app stores or websites like uh, description, the keywords, screenshots. So the game itself is not localized in this in, in the target language, but everything about the, the, the information about it is translated. We have partial localization in which we are translating the in-game text and uh, the subtitles. And if your client is that rich and ready to pay so much money, you have this full localization in which we are translate all in and out game content, including video um, audio files. So we are, um, we in this case, we, we just don't stop with the translator. We need uh, voiceovers, we, we, need, we need dubbing, so it's um, like making the game like fully localized and ready to be uh, sold in, in, in a target um, for the target audience in, in, in a specific country or region. So Eman, for all these processes that you just mentioned when it comes to game localization, uh, the activities carried out by different localization specialists or can they be carried out by one professional? Um, no, as a localization localizer or video game translator, you, you, you just uh, contact with the project manager and if you're a freelancer, you start with the vendor manager and then a project manager and you translate the game and then came the reviewers and after the reviewers, uh, quality assessment people and uh, after the quality assessment is the testing people uh, and before you start, you have this game uh, developers who develop the games and the people who are responsible for creating the content in the game and uh, making the animations and all this stuff, but you don't deal with these people. If you have any question or you have any um, thing to ask, uh, you, you contact your project manager or vendor manager. Uh, sometimes you can ask the client himself or herself if she or he um, is, is, is available uh, or if this is an option for you. So um, you, don't, you, you don't deal with so many people uh, unless the, the project is divided into like so many uh, files or, or or so many like parts. So you, you deal with your, your colleagues. Um, that's it, I guess. I can imagine that that means you'd have to, to also have very good team working relationship. And uh, based on that, I want to find out some of the skills that have helped you to thrive in this industry and some of the skills that maybe you can encourage others to have so that they can also do well in the game localization industry. Yeah, sure. Um, like video game translators should have a set of skills, in my opinion. Um, first, you, you should be creative. And this is like, you know, this is it. You should be creative. Why? Because you're dealing with bonds, you're, you're dealing with humor, wordplay, you, you're dealing with cultural differences. Sometimes you face songs and poems and uh, sometimes you have character limits and you have, um, if you're translating into a gender language like me, 
it's a bit challenging. So you, you need to be creative to overcome these challenges, to overcome these obstacles while translating, to make the translation smoothly. And, you know, uh, sometimes the, the game, the source game or the source content is well written at creatively written. So you should deal, uh, you have this problem of having like your target uh text like equivalent to the source text um style or or you know the the high language used you also need to be familiar with technology we're using cat tools and sometimes the the client asks you to work in an unknown platform for you so you should be ready to know how to deal with these platform or to use these platforms and you know the internet is there and you know like, google got your back so if you don't understand uh, how to use um a, a specific platform you should like google it and you'll find how to deal with this but the familiarity itself is like is, is an, a big asset for you um you should also be comfortable with translating different types of text so we don't translate only the games or the dialogues between characters in the new games. No, we have manuals, we have tutorials, we have legal texts, uh, we have marketing texts in which you send newsletters to the players informing them of new content or updates. We have dialogues between characters. We have description of events if the game has an, any events or release any events. Another skill is the familiarity of the world of games itself. Because uh, when you play games, you understand the dynamics of the world of games. And you're familiar with, you know, like the events, the characters, the menus, the, the, everything, the manuals itself, the tutorials, everything. So um, the more you know about the games and the world of games, the better, of course. Um, you should also um, be able to start new things and challenges. Voila, yeah, because you're starting a project or a game and you know all the style guide and instructions, the client in, you know the universe of the game, how characters react. Uh, if the game is historical, you know the era of the game. Um, you, you know like everything about the game and you're, you're an expert. But unfortunately, there is a time that this game will be like finished and the project is finished and you have to start a new project and a new game, a new style guide, new instructions, uh, new characters, new universe. So everything is new and you're, you're feeling like a little bit mm, depressed or sad, but you will get over it by time. You should also be familiar with the different types of games. Uh, like we have so many genres and games. It's not like always like Fortnite or shooting games. No, we have RPGs. We have multiplayer online games. We have racing games, horror games, adventure, open world, sports, fighting, um, dance, uh, sing singing. We have some, um, music. Uh, and you know, like the more you know genres of games, the better for you uh, to understand. And like, it's not a must to to know like all the genres. No, like when you start with one or two genres, you will like learn the other by time and by practicing. Uh, nothing is better than practicing translating different uh, genres of games. Uh, also, you should be attentive to details. Yeah, that's very clear because we don't have so much context in video games. Uh, sometimes the games are not released yet. So we play the guessing game like most of the time, but sometimes it doesn't work. So in this case, we ask for more content. Uh, so it's also not to be attentive because um, in big games we have several characters and every character has their own tone, uh, self-repeated words or a specific sense of humor. Also, um, you should be attentive and 
to know the platform at which the game will be available because every platform has its own terms and you should know the different terms of each platform. Um, yeah, I guess these are um, the skills. Of course, you, you should like know your target language and your uh, the cultural elements in your uh, target language. He also mentioned earlier on that one has to be a game lover in order to be able to localize games properly. However, on the flip side of the coin, there is also the fact that people can get addicted to games. So as a language professional who is localizing games, is there not a risk of getting addicted to playing these games often? Yeah. Um... Unfortunately, there are some people who are addicted to playing games and um, but the countries, um, some countries are aware of this and they have like, like legal restrictions over um, the, the number of viewing or the, the game's addiction. Uh, even some companies, game companies, um, became more interested in the mental health of uh, the gamers or the people who play their games and sometimes they um like have this uh, update of saying that like you should rest you should like uh, communicate with like real friends in the real world um of course you should have like limits yeah i enjoy the game but i have like so many stuff to do and uh, i have to close the game right now and the next time i will see what i will do with this enemies or or the the boss of the game so um you know like like everything, you your self-discipline is key in life. Great. So, um, Emma, you are an English-Arabic translator. What do you think about Arabic within the gaming industry? Is it rising? Is it getting more audiences? And are clients requesting for more of that? Yeah, Arabic is, is, is one of the fastest growing um, languages in video games. Um, let's, let's explain first why the gaming market is this huge and why it's like booming all that recently. Uh, so in 2018, the global gaming market was reportedly worth $138 billion. Um, imagine how, how much is this? Um, and last year, while many economic sectors were heavily impacted, the video game world is all about booming so game sales are were reaching very high levels especially digital uh, and streaming platforms such as twitch uh, reached uh, like a record of viewing with 5 billion hours uh, in the second quarter uh, of 2020. Uh, the number of gamers all over the world is over 2 billion and uh, 800 million gamers all over the world and it's predicted that they will grow by another what, 100 uh, million people by the end of this year so it's 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 very big and the more you delve in to um, the gaming market the more you know it's it's bigger than you think before let's say that uh, Arabic or the airport is not like doesn't have the line share of the game uh, of the gaming market. The the line share belongs to Asia Pacific region. Uh, it's the heart of the global video gaming industry. So according to estimates, there were over 1.5 billion video games in the region in 2020, and generating combined revenue of 78.3 million US dollars. I want just to um, make a disclaimer here. All the numbers mentioned are from uh, Statista and Localized Direct latest report in game localization. So these numbers are, uh, you know, we're talking about big numbers and huge numbers in the gaming industry. So uh, people became ready to purchase full games and downloads and support uh, live streamers. Everyone last year was like trying to escape from the real world, from the pandemic. Uh, some people have so much free time and you don't have anything like the technology. So you're just try to play the games. 
So according to localized direct latest report, uh, game developers most frequently translated games into German, French, European, Spanish, Brazilian, Portuguese, Russian, Italian, simplified Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Polish uh, till last year, 2020. And the next, like, ranked from 11 till 20, Arabic, Latin, Spanish, Turkish, traditional Chinese spoken in Hong Kong, traditional Chinese spoken in Taiwan, Dutch, Swedish, Thai, Vietnamese, and Indonesian. So um, according to this, Arabic is one of the, of the top 20 languages in, in the gaming market. So uh, let's talk about Arabic itself. So Arabic is the, the fifth most popular language with um, 420 million speakers. We're representing 6% of the global population. And we have a, a large gaming community and um, with 237 internet users. So it's, it's like we are like so many people. And of course, this like attracts uh, the gaming companies. Um, so, um, more than 20 countries claim Arabic as an official language. Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Egypt are the most prof profitable in terms of gaming revenues. Uh, the Arabic-speaking countries take up the lion's share of the so-called MENA region, which includes uh, 18 countries in the Middle East and North Africa. You know, like, African languages are are not that used so much because uh, in the gaming industry, unfortunately, because so many uh, Africans speak English or French. So from the gaming company's perspective, it's time and money, money wasting if you are translating into a new language and that it's spoken by this number of people. But there are some um, non-profit organizations that are trying to, you know, accelerate the process of getting the games in the hands of African players and gamers, not only just mobile games. It started with mobile games, but I guess it's it will be better in the new, in the near future, and I hope so. Also, the little number of gamers in Africa nowadays do not encourage the companies to translate games and pay extra money for. Uh, um, fewer number of gamers there. Um, so th this can be solved like in the near future. We, we're having these uh, like promising uh, decisions or things. Uh, for LSPs and, you know, the, the, the linguistic enthusiasts, uh, just like me, because I'm very uh, interested in languages, um, you should like... Uh, if you don't have this opportunity to play games because you're living in a country that restricts um, games or ban them or anything, you have this uh, option of playing mobile games or watch people who play games on YouTube. Sometimes um, I do this because I cannot afford to like to buy all the games because they are very expensive. So uh, I, I watch the game on YouTube and I know how just people play it and the dynamics of the game, you know, and one video will lead to uh, the other and you will understand um, like most of the things in, in, in this game or in the gaming world. This will definitely help you to understand the gaming dynamics and how this world looks and how you can take a place in this um, big room. The figures that you have mentioned are a clear indication that there is actually a boom when it comes to games within Arab nations. What do you think explains this? Uh, so the widespread networks and advanced hardware made it possible for gamers to play more online games. Um, in addition, the promising economic development trends bring more revenue opportunities for game studios expanding to these markets. Um, so the, the, the big names in the gaming market started to have their studios in Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates because you're, you're open to the world and you have uh, this um, 
amount of gamers or people who can play and definitely can uh, increase the sales of these companies. And I, I also would like to um, say that people in Persian Gulf countries uh, live a luxurious life. So they are ready to buy games and they, they are ready to spend money over games. The reasons you have given for the boom in the gaming industry in Arab nations demonstrates that in the future there's going to be more and more opportunities in that field. And I want to believe that the growth of the gaming industry in these nations has been spurred by specific genres of games. I know that we have action games, we have shooter games and fighting games and all that. What genres of games have been thriving when it comes to Arab nations? Um, the most popular games or the, the most popular genres uh, among Arabic players are arcade, action, sports, racing, and casual games. So um, the top countries in the, in the Arab world, like I've said before, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Egypt. But Saudi Arabia is the most profitable Arabic-speaking market, and it ranks at 22 by global gaming revenue, and 92% of the gamers consider themselves gaming enthusiasts. Um, the most popular things in the United Arab Emirates are the mobile games, uh, especially puzzles. And um, the, the United Arab Emirates is known as a big spender in the gaming industry with most of the money going to mobile games. Around 39% uh, of gamers in the United Arab Emirates prefer to spend on mobile games, while 33% prefer PC and 38% prefer playing with consoles. Yeah, so this is how the airport is like big or um, huge for the gaming and it attracts so many uh, people. Also, uh, the number of people who are young and uh, the young people is definitely the target of the gaming companies. They are very big in the airport and um, the everybody is like, they are um, they're ready to experience new things in the virtual world. Uh, sometimes people um, seek to games or video games to have friendships and have to feel this feeling of belonging, uh, especially in hard times. Uh, some people, especially people with disability, uh, they cannot like go out with people and sometimes um, they, they resort to video games and have these online friends and they play with each other and enjoy their time together and that makes the feeling of community and the feeling of belonging uh, grow or became higher. I couldn't have, um, couldn't have imagined that there will be 2.8 billion gamers in the world. That's really interesting. It means that a lot of people are really into games yeah and, and even you may think that the you know the people who are playing games are the younger generation Th this is like no uh some people are uh over 35 uh, some people even at 60 years old they are playing games because the, you know the feeling of loneliness sometimes like it makes you like seek another world or you need to like feel that you belong to the community, especially in, in the hard times. Uh, I'm assuring the hard times because we're living in, during a pandemic and it's not easy for people. Some people like lost uh, their jobs, lost their beloved ones. Um, they lost so many things. So in and, and the games, we'd like to win. And if you, if you don't win, you find this community of people who enjoy themselves and play with you especially in multi multiplayer online games. Um, and the gaming companies realize this. And some companies uh, even release games for free and uh, can make players play online for free. So if you don't buy the game, you can enjoy yourself and play online with your friends. And if you don't have enough money, you can like download the game and have it like for the rest of your life and enjoy your time. So um, 
it's 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 great and sometimes you feel like it's it's a big community and um, yeah it's like this great um and I'm, i'm a bit i'm a bit curious you you mentioned some figures for the gaming industry for arab nations what do you think is the potential of the gaming industry for for africa in general and game localization and what advice would you have for language service providers who might want to venture into that area yeah um the, the african region is one of the regions in the world where the youth population is increasing uh it's predicted by 2050 africa's young people uh or those who aged between one year and 24 years will witness an increase of around 50 percent so africa is expected to have the most significant number of young people and this is critical to the content the content's future when it comes to gaming uh the statistic present the leading video gaming markets in africa in 2018 ranked by revenue are egypt and south africa and morocco like in this order um and the revenues are pretty huge and and big and you have this uh thing of uh playing with uh video video games in mobile games like you're playing uh the game on mobile games because some african countries have restrictions uh or legalizations over uh, money transaction so you you don't enjoy the whole experience of playing uh online and buying like new content of the game or buying online games so you seek to uh, free games or mobile games Uh, like most african gamers do they are playing mobile games and free mobile games just because um they they, they are the only option for them but um this thing is going to change like in the near future because we have seen so many african uh, influencers or african creative individuals are like expanding in some big platforms like netflix and they're, they're starting to create their own content so it's it's promising and um, so many companies are like consider the, the this promising growing of uh, young people in africa and um and, and it's definitely will help people uh in the future to play like online games and the idea of restrictions over money transactions will sooner or later be solved and we will be like like everyone in the in the world i really hope that we'll get to that stage so um emma you mentioned that you are a game lover yourself you play a lot of games and so i'd like to know what are some of your favorite games yeah i i like the the adventure games and open world games because i like just sometimes i forget about the missions and sometimes i forget just i would like to experience this world or uh to know this this era especially i i like assassin's creed so much so uh when i play like assassin's creed every chapter in a, in a particular historical era and i know about about so many uh historical places and historical uh figures from assassin's creed when i was young that was like an epic for me just uh i know ancient rome i know the the ancient egypt uh and that's that's great for your history class if you <laughs> find it difficult to uh, memorize everything so um i like to, to discover the like the places in the game um also like racing games for the same reason um i i play like a race and i choose like the city in which the race will be uh hold or or begin or happen uh so sometimes i choose um london or uh lisbon or paris just to like to figure the world of this city and the uh, the popular places the streets and um yeah I, I call me not 
uh, like uh, an old person or like um, an old is uh, is a term used in in the gaming community, uh, and it's used to describe people who are like beginners and who are like don't complete the missions and they are just easily got defeated by the enemies. I didn't care. I just uh, play the game and I enjoy myself. And I thought this is uh, what's interesting about it. I think I'm going to look for some of these games and play them myself because the way you talk about them, they sound very, very exciting. So Emma, you've spoken about the skills that are required to become a game localization specialist. Are there other additional things that are needed? For instance, a language professional who wants to become a game localization specialist might need to take some courses or some training programs. Do you have any suggestions for these? Yeah, sure. There's always an opportunity for everyone. Like I've said, there are required skills and you should like acquire these skills to like to I don't like the word competition or to be competent or to be a good translator or an exceptional translator, if you would like to describe it this way. So you have this opportunity of mastering your language and acquiring those skills. And your opportunity is bigger if you're translating into a real language or if you are translating from uh, one of the popular languages or the, the used language. Uh, because in localization, we we don't just have the source uh, language and the target language. We have something called pivot language or pivot localization. Yeah, pivot. If you're a Friends fan, you're just uh, remembering Ross yelling at Rachel and Rachel and Chandler, and say when they are moving the couch, and he says pivot, pivot, pivot. That's a pivot. We do a pivot if um, the the original source or the the first wave uh, of the localization content uh, is not written or is not created in English or French. The the Asian uh, game studios and publishers uh, sometimes prefer using Chinese, Japanese, or Korean as uh, the first wave in their localization process. So. Um, the the most common practice in this case is uh, translating from Chinese, Japanese, or Korean into English. And after that, we're making English at the source language because it's easy to have so many translators translate, that translate from English into many different uh, target languages. And um, this, this can be seen as feasible time and cost-effective opportunity for localizations into low-sourced and rare languages. If you're an Arabic um, linguist or uh, trying to enter the or you're starting your first steps in the game localization, you should like know your Arabic so much and know how the different countries in our Arabic in our Arab world, uh, uses their dialects because sometimes the in-game dialogues, like uh, I've said that before, are written in in, in a certain dialect. So you should um, understand this, and you should like be careful when it comes to translating uh, a game that has uh, so many characters and. And the, the client said that we should use a neutral language uh, because Arabic is a gender language. For example, if we are addressing a male person, we say anta, which means you. The same you applies to if um, addressing a female and we say anti. If we are addressing two males or two females, we say antuma and it's, it's, it's all, all these uh, pronouns are equivalent to you. You are definitely should be familiar with the cultural and religious sensitivities we have here in the Arab world. Because there are quite a lot of sensitive topics to consider when translating video games uh, in, into Arabic. For example, homosexuality, explicit sexual scenes, nudity, Alcohol, religious symbols, or mentioning verse from Quran or Bible are still things to avoid 
when translating video games in Arabic. You know, like I'm, I'm a good example about the the idea of respecting the the cultural and religious sensitivities is the popular game Happy Farm. We have the the equivalent uh, translation for Happy Farm in Arabic is Al Bazra Saida. It's nothing. Nothing was changed about the the. It's happy is a Saida and farm is Al Mazra. So we don't change anything in the title of this game. But the game uh, reached the high number of players in Arabic-speaking countries because a uh, successfully localized Arabic version that took the local culture into account and doesn't feature pigs because Muslims don't raise them. So that was a good one because you respect the culture and you tell your client if you... You're definitely a translator started to say, we don't have pigs and we don't raise pigs here. Uh, and raise this query to uh, the client or the project manager. And the client noticed that, that would have impact the, the game negatively. So uh, we need to change this. So they didn't feature pigs. And uh, so everybody is happy now. Yeah, that's... Uh, you know, like game localization is a very big topic. You cannot just uh, say, I, I don't know, like you have like millions of episodes and millions of books or papers to talk about. Um, so, yeah. All right. So, Elman, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We discussed game localization and the rise of Arabic in the gaming industry. And it was very interesting. Uh, for our listeners, if you want to have more information about the gaming industry or maybe for a language professional who wants to delve into this area, you can reach out to Eman Abdul. Her LinkedIn profile is in the podcast description. So Eman, thank you so much for coming and uh, we'll get in touch once again. Thank you so much, Adi, for this opportunity. And I hope everyone enjoyed this uh, talk. Um, yeah, I, I hope to see you like in the near future saying that the African languages are popular and the, the big names in the gaming market are starting uh, to expand to the African uh, countries. I look forward to that also. Thank you. We invite you to go to multilingual.com slash Africa LSP to receive a free one-year digital subscription to Multilingual Magazine. You can also find this link in the podcast description.